All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 82, and today I will be discussing an incredibly important compound that was discovered inside the lower separation chamber system of the Bed Pyramid and also inside the extraction chamber of the Great Pyramid of Giza that is directly related to the chemical reaction sequences that were occurring in both of these structures. Quick side personal note, since I have been living here in Egypt, I have taken on caring for anywhere from four to seven of the street cats around my building, including one that sleeps outside of my door every night. Over the past month, two new kittens that have a mother, and in the past week, one new kitten that does not, which I am now responsible for bottle feeding. So if you would, please say a prayer of support for me and a prayer of good luck for these three little kittens. And inshallah, God willing, I will give them the opportunity to have the best little cat lives possible. If this is the type of content that you're interested in regarding the function of the Egyptian pyramids, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification button, like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, just check out thelandofchem.com. This is the new G exclusive t-shirt with this beautiful new purple print. I absolutely love it. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at the Land of Chem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. <laughs> All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. And to preface the data and chemical analysis that I will be presenting today, here is a clip from my recent expedition inside the Bed Pyramid of Dashur, where I'm discussing the salt layer that is covering the walls of the lower separation chamber system. At first, I thought this might be halite, a naturally occurring form of sodium chloride that is also known as rock salt. However, after seeing this video, one of my team members from the Acida project sent me the chemical composition of this material and I immediately understood exactly why it was inside of these chambers and what its function was. So here is some on-site footage so you can see this compound up close and personal. All right, so now I've done here what I've came to do in the lower chamber. Okay, so here is what I was talking about. So for example, you can see the salt has started to flake off here. That's why there's no salt over here. Because it's all just flaked off of this part. This is not the same as what we were looking at over there. because there's no delineation of a crack or repair here. This is just the salt has flaked off, just like that. And it's flaked off of this entire area. All right, now, time to ascend the staircase. Yalla bean. All right, now that you have seen this material, let's move on to its chemical composition and function. So here is an image sent to me by the Acida Project of a sample of this salt that was taken during their 2010 research expedition. They had exclusive access into this site before it was ever officially open to the public. And I will put a link in the video description below so you can see the differences inside of this structure from 13 years ago compared to how it looks today after it has been fully quote unquote renovated. And it turns out that this salt is not halite, but rather crystalline anhydrous calcium sulfate. And here is a side note that I stumbled across in my research for today's episode. This image of a calcium sulfate anhydrite kiln as described here, the Catalyst Science Discovery Center in Winds, England has a relief carving of an anhydrite kiln made from a piece of anhydrite for the United Sulfuric Acid Corporation. Hmm, 
the Catalyst Science Discovery Center, and the United Sulfuric Acid Corporation. Any of this sounding familiar? It definitely should be. And the never-ending series of quote-unquote coincidences that have presented themselves on my journey never cease to amaze me. And we will be coming back to this in just a moment. But now, on to some properties of calcium sulfate. First, it is water insoluble in its anhydrous form. This is particularly relevant to our discussion, as from day one, I have proposed that all of these structures were coated with a water resistant coating or sealing compound. And this specific reference coming to us from science coverage. And next, this one from encyclopedia.com stating that calcium sulfate is insoluble in water and in most organic solvents. Okay, now we are really getting to some even more extremely relevant properties of this far from trivial salt layer. Next, I will read the rest of the portion of this entry. Both the anhydrous and dihydrate forms of calcium sulfate occur naturally in the form of the minerals anhydrite, angelite, mariasite, karstenite, and gypsum. These minerals have been known to humans and used by them for thousands of years. The method for converting natural gypsum to the hemihydrate, quote unquote, plaster of Paris has also been known and used for a very long period of time. Archaeologists have learned that the Egyptians developed a method for converting gypsum to plaster of Paris, which was then used as mortars to join blocks in buildings more than 5,000 years ago. All right, now things are really heating up as plaster of Paris is also a water insoluble coating compound. And I will read the following regarding more properties of plaster of Paris from physicsforums.com. I've done extensive experiments on this subject using many acids and caustic chemicals. My finding, which is contrary to popular belief, is that acids had no effect on plaster of Paris, regardless of the concentrations. Plaster of Paris did, however, dissolve with chemicals on the base end of the pH scale, not acids. I did various tests with hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, acetic acid, various mixes of hydrochloric, nitric, and sulfuric under various temperatures and lengths of time with various sample pieces almost without any success. This whole process of experimentation took place over several weeks until I hit upon baking soda and quote unquote brushed away the big block in about one day. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, does any of this sound familiar? It definitely should be, but I am not even close to done yet. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you wanna help support the channel, just check out thelandofchem.com. I have some fire Land of Chem merch, hoodies, long sleeve shirts, t-shirts with both different logos, digital copies of the book are still available, reprints will be coming out soon. Also, extremely rare signed copies of the limited first edition will also be on the website. I will keep you posted when everything is ready, but for now, if you wanna show some love, just check out thelandofchem.com and thank you all so much for the support. All right, now let's take a look at what happens when you react a dilute solution of sulfuric acid, as I have proposed, was being produced inside the Great Pyramid of Giza with calcium carbonate limestone. And you can see here, the reaction proceeds as follows. Calcium carbonate plus sulfuric acid produces calcium sulfate, carbon dioxide, and water. But there is a very interesting feature about this reaction when applied to a solid stone block. For example, like these solid limestone blocks inside of the pyramids. And that brings me to the question proposed on Chemistry Stack Exchange, asking why a chemical reaction stops when a solid compound is being produced on a particular surface. And I will read the question as stated here. Why does a reaction stop when turning into a solid? I recently was looking at a question about the volume of carbon dioxide produced when reacting calcium carbonate with a dilute solution of sulfuric acid versus nitric acid. In the answer, it says that calcium sulfate is produced, which is a solid, which stops the reaction, but I don't get why. Calcium nitrate produces an aqueous solution, 
which causes the reaction to carry on reacting. And here are the two different reactions that are being discussed. The first, which I have already described between limestone and sulfuric acid producing water insoluble calcium sulfate. And the second, between limestone and nitric acid producing soluble calcium nitrate. And now I will read the following here. The reason is due to the surface area of calcium carbonate available to react. When reacting a block of solid calcium carbonate with dilute sulfuric acid, solid calcium sulfate is produced, which is deposited on the surface of the calcium carbonate block, since that is where the reaction occurs. The calcium sulfate is insoluble in dilute sulfuric acid, and so you end up with a calcium carbonate coated with a layer of calcium sulfate, which stops the acid from getting at the carbonate and stops the reaction. In contrast, calcium nitrate produced from the reaction with nitric acid is highly soluble in dilute nitric acid, and so no solid layer forms around the carbonate block, and the reaction can continue until one of the reagents is used up. Now, let's propose that you run the first cycle of your manufacturing process inside the Great Pyramid of Giza to produce the initial batch of dilute sulfuric acid, which then reacts with the surface layer of calcium carbonate inside the limestone chambers to produce a solid water and acid insoluble layer of calcium sulfate that prevents further reaction from occurring, thus coating, sealing, and protecting the limestone chambers from further damage. Well, this must mean that there has to be some evidence of calcium sulfate inside the Great Pyramid, right? Well, let me bring your attention to this, a reference that I found on the website of my good friend Danny Kerr, teslapyramids.com, link in the video description below, discussing the salt layer that was discovered inside the quote-unquote Queen's Chamber, or as we know it to be, the extraction chamber of the Great Pyramid that states the following. In 1978, Dr. Patrick Flanagan asked the Arizona Bureau of Geology and Mineral Technology to analyze a sample of this salt. They found it to be a mixture of calcium carbonate, limestone, sodium chloride, halite or salt, and calcium sulfate, gypsum, also known as plaster of Paris. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I proverbially drop the microphone and the crowd goes wild. This was episode 82, chemically resistant coating compounds and calcium sulfate. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode in the series, we are on Sunday site visit nine, featuring an awesome expedition inside the step pyramid of Saqqara, featuring some new revelations about the function of this structure. If this is the type of content that you're interested in, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell, like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's episode. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.